Welcome to the Free Birth Podcast, a supportive space for people who are learning, exploring, and celebrating their autonomous choices in childbirth. Together, we'll unpack truths, share personal stories, and claim our ability to birth freely and intuitively. Here's your host, Emily Saldea. show we have Lorena from South Carolina. After a less than desirable hospital birth that included an unconsenting episiotomy and having her baby taken away, Lorena sought to have her second child at a birth center with midwives. Towards the end of her pregnancy, her midwives dropped her from care with little explanation. Left with no other options, Lorena settled into the reality that she was going to free birth in her home. She educated herself, and it turned out to be a blessing in disguise, and she wound up having a quick and wonderful birth with her husband by her side. My first baby was pretty much my conventional baby, and my second baby was my all-natural baby. Um, I had him through induction, for no other reason other than I just didn't want to be pregnant. I was completely done. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a, it was an option and it was available. And my doctor was like, yeah, sure, we'll induce you on this day. Um, and so I got induced at 2 o'clock in the morning, went to sleep, woke up, seven something. He uh, he busted my waters and um, I went back to sleep. And... Uh, at like 10, I was woken up and, uh, the nurse was like, yeah, you're fully dilated. You're about to have the baby in your sleep. Cause I was completely relaxed and you're relaxed. Your labor doesn't get stalled typically. Um, so yeah, uh, the doctor, I didn't see him anytime other than busting my waters. And when he came back in for delivery, so uh, during uh, delivery, he cut me, so he gave me an episiotomy without really asking me, and he did a suction on my baby, which was uh. completely unnecessary. And um, after that, my husband it was in the Navy at the time, and he was in Italy, so my sister had him on Skype on my laptop. And so they gave me my son once he came out, and put him on my chest for like a couple of minutes and then snatched him and went to this other room and I didn't see him for a good 10 minutes, but my husband did. Um, And and are you like, when they're doing all that stuff with the, with the um, vacuum, are you just like thinking, Oh, this is just what they do. No, like it happened so quick because he was already coming out anyway. Mm -hmm. He was already coming out anyway. It was completely unnecessary. So I yeah. was just like, what the hell? Is, I was I was confused. Like, what is going on? Is this normal? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because this is my first child. I don't know. My well, mom's like, no, don't do that. She's just chilling. So I'm like, okay, I guess. I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, they took him into the other room and started cleaning him up and whatever it is that they do, to, uh, checking his AFCAR and all of that. And the nurse and the doctor got into it about it because – Apparently, my son's Asgard score was low in the first couple minutes, and they got into it about it. So while he's getting cleaned up, I was uh, delivering the placenta. Mm-hmm. Um, after that, like throughout the whole time, I kept telling the nurse I didn't want my son away from me. I didn't want my son away from me. So I was kind of pissed that they took him from, into a whole other room at that time. Yeah. And then they moved me to another room and took him. And I had to call down there like two times to get him to come back. And it was like an hour later. And I was mad about that. I did get to nurse him before they did do that, though. Um, He nursed well. He latched on just fine. Uh, Although the beginning of breastfeeding, like the first two weeks, was terrible. I didn't know if I could do it. Yeah. Um, Because I say he latched. He latched fine, but, like, his latch wasn't consistent. But anyway, so fast forward to my next baby. Um, I had him in 2016, and a lot of things have changed by then. I have gone completely organic, 
don't mess with any chemicals, um, eating wise and pretty much in my entire like lifestyle. Um So what was the age, what was the age difference? So you have um you have I, your baby, you figure out breastfeeding, you're kinda of processing that first birth and what's happening emotionally for you in between the time that you have your first son and your second baby where you know that you're not going back or did you not realize that until you were already pregnant again? No, I knew I wasn't going to do any of that again, but then I had, like, education is what happened. Sorry, you broke up. Say that again. Education is what happened. I, I started educating myself after I had my first son because I started breaking out from a lot of the stuff I was consuming, and unbeknownst to me, for six months, he was he was a nightmare. He was in pain. He was itching. Mm. Everything was food food allergy induced and they were like, Oh, it's eczema. Here's steroids and I was just like I wasn't that far gone where I thought steroids was a good idea for a kid. Mm-hmm. Like, you know. So um finally I got a food allergy test on him at six months and it comes to find out like, fifteen different things I was eating was making him miserable. Aww. So from that point on I started looking at ingredients and everything because dairy was a big thing and dairy is in everything. So looking at ingredients and then realizing I didn't know what none of these chemical names were. So Googling and researching what they were, finding out that they cause all kinds of issues, headaches, constipation, migraines, like dizziness, ridiculous amount of symptoms in your food. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that made me go organic. And you, you still got to be careful with organic and read uh, labels on organic foods. And my son, my oldest was three when I got pregnant. Mm-hmm. Um, and by then I had already been looking into like midwifer and all of that. Um, so I was like, yeah, there's no way I'm going back to a hospital. It's, yeah. It's not happening. So I started looking at this birth place that I, that's near me and, um, I'm going in there and I'm just like the person that gets on the person that owns the place. I get on her nerves because I ask too many <laughs> questions. I asked too many questions, and she just, she just, I guess she expected me to go with the flow, and I'm ho- totally past that point in my life. I question mm-hmm. everything. Um, well, especially after I'm, the birth that you've had, of course yeah. you're going to have your wits about you this time. Yeah, and so I'm asking all these questions, and she tells me a couple times, she was like, I don't know if this is going to be the place for you, she was like, you might want to do it at home birth with a midwife. And that's $3,000 on the low end. And I'm just like, I just don't have $3,000 to sure. carry my own baby and push my own baby out. Like I'm doing all the work. Mm-hmm. What do you need $3,000 for? It just, it didn't make sense to me. I don't like that. So, um, I mean, no disrespect to midwives. I know that they do great jobs and all, but you know, I'm not, I don't got it like that. So, um, well, and look, that's, you're touching on a very real thing that midwifery, at, you know, in 3000 is way cheaper than what it is out here, out here at 6000 in California. Yeah. And, you know, like, you're, you're touching on a, a very real issue that midwifery is for the privileged. It's for people who can afford that mm-hmm. insurance doesn't cover it. And so and it's they not should. accessible. Of course they should. And it's not accessible to everybody. And so it, it really puts, you know, people who don't just have an extra couple thousand dollars laying around in a really hard situation if they want to avoid the one option that they have, you know, other than unassisted, which is to go back and have another abusive birth. Exactly. And like I said, that was the low end because I only saw like one person that was willing to do it for 3000 mm-hmm. and the rest of them were closer to five. So yeah. I was just like, nah, that's not, like, I would love to have a home birth with a midwife and be cool, but, you know, I'm just not able to do that. It's not in the funds. We get paid. I don't know where this, this misconception with that military gets paid really well. We don't. So, um, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, that, um, and that's, that's the tough thing, right, because it's not, 
it's also not the midwife's fault, of course, for charging no. what is true. They got to see and it, Yeah, they got to eat. Like, they're doing hard work. Yeah. They, they bust ass. Like, I've worked with a lot of midwives and, you know, 5000 6000 for for how much care they do is, like, nothing. Yeah. But it ain't nothing, right. you know, to someone who doesn't have that. So it's exactly. a really, yeah, it's a tough spot. And it's. It's ridiculous because at the end of the day, it would be cheaper for insurance to cover a midwife than it is for the hospital. Yeah, but they're, they don't, they insurance doesn't look at, oh, you know, the people who are going to have a hands-off, cheap birth, those are not even their best clients. You know, it's interesting. Yeah, that's, it's terrible. It's, yeah. And <laughs> the business of being born brings up, touches on a lot of that. Mm-hmm. So you're pregnant, you're looking for a midwife, but everything's a couple thousand dollars. So then what? Yeah, so so I go to uh, a birth place that's near me, and um, I go there, and she was like, yeah, you should do a home birth. And I'm like, yeah, I can't. So mm-hmm. um, I'm going to stick with you guys. I'm just going to try to make this work. And she's, like, telling me all these stipulations, and I'm just like, I thought this was supposed to be a natural birth center. Like, I feel like this is just, like, a smaller a downgrade from the hospital. So it's um, a birth center that insurance pays for? Yeah. It, okay. I, I See, this is the thing. I was under TRICARE, and they were like, no, we don't – they only wanted to cover a midwife through a hospital, which was basically right. like you may get the midwife, you may not, and you mm-hmm. may end up with an OB anyway. And I was like, nah, I don't, I don't even want to be in a hospital. Yeah. So, um, I had to go through loops and bounds and leaps and managers for like two months to get that covered in the first place. So, um, I finally got them covered. And I went to them, and I went to them until I was 36 weeks pregnant. Oh, okay. So what happened? What happened was I called the hospital and asked them, and that me like to my mind you the whole time I'm pregnant, I'm like I may have to do a home birth regardless. Mm-hmm. I may have to do this by myself. And I also called my mother-in-law, and I was like, Hey, you're a nurse, you deliver babies. She's in Guam though. I was like, Is there any way you could be because she's a baby? Mm-hmm. She's in the Navy, too. Is there any way you could be here for the birth? Because I just would really rather do this at my home by myself. <laughs> Is there any way you could be here for that? Aww. I'm like, no. I'm, I'm sure she like, would have loved to. <laughs> yeah. But so that didn't work. So, um, so when did it occur yeah. to you, at what point in your pregnancy did you realize, I'm going to stay home and do this on my own? The whole time I was thinking that that was probably going to happen because all these stipulations, they were like, yeah, if you if you pop group, group strep B positive, you're going to have to get antibiotics. And mm-hmm. that's not happening. I'm not doing that. It's mm-hmm. not happening. That defeats the purpose of vaginal birth completely. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, yeah, okay. And I'm just like humoring them. And I'm like, okay. In the back of my mind, I'm telling myself and my husband, like, hey, if I'm group strep B positive, I'm sticking garlic up in there until I had a baby, and we're not going to the, the place. I'm sorry, it's not happening. I'm not going to the um. I'm not going to get antibiotics. It's not happening. You're not sticking me with nothing. I want a natural birth. I don't want nothing stuck up in me. No. So yeah. My husband and I already knew like that was a possibility, a very strong possibility because that and um. What did they say? That was the main thing. I just didn't like the restriction of it all. Like, and how did do how did your man? Birth. Of course. And how did your man respond to all of that? Was he? He totally... was nervous. He yeah. was so nervous. He was losing his mind. <laughs> so was that a point of contention in the relationship, or did he eventually get on board? He, I mean, he knows. He knows how I am, and, like, I've been on this journey of going as natural as I possibly know how, and the more I research I can since our oldest was born. So he already knew, like, that was a very strong possibility. And um, had we been able to afford it, we would have been doing it with the midwife at home in the first place. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, but you know um, what? Here's the crazy thing. If you had been able to afford it and done it with a regulated midwife – 
which is what you probably would have done, you would have had almost all of the same stipulations. You would have had to get antibiotics. You would have, you know, like you would have had, it's not like midwives are incredible, especially regulated midwives are incredible at offering all of this informed consent and right to refusal. You know, it is the same thing. You would have been tested for GBS and if it had been positive, antibiotics would have been strongly recommended and administered every four hours at your home birth, you know? Yeah. And at that point, they would have got fired because I wouldn't have been doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and this speaks to what it should be, which is as a patient, you have legal rights to the right to refusal and informed consent. Exactly. So technically, you should be able to say, you know, thank you so much for your input, and I am going to respectfully decline, mm-hmm. and that's the end of the conversation. But as we know, that's not how it goes. So, okay, but, so you, you're doing your care with this kind of one level lower than a hospital kind of medicalized birth center. Yeah. And in the and back there, of your mind, the, you're just kind of like rolling your eyes knowing that you're not really going to show up. Yes, yeah, just in case. Like if, if something goes wrong, just in case. Like I'm not. And they were like, um, the reasoning behind all of this was it, it makes sense. I mean, yeah, I understood. They were, they had to be like legitimate. Like that was the state regulations of course so i'm not i'm not knocking them for that but it ain't what i wanted for my birth so i wasn't with it yeah so at one point right before i hit yeah 36 weeks because 37 weeks is when they were okay with delivering me anytime before that they were like if you if you go into labor for this you're gonna have to go to the hospital Mm -hmm. so at 36 weeks i started having a lot of false labor and i was like i don't know what's going on i'm maybe having this baby this weekend and like i hit 37 weeks that next week and I was like, oh, my God, I cannot. So I called the hospital. And I'm like, so I just wanted to know what they did because I haven't done this before by myself. So I was like, if I bring in the baby and I've had my baby at home, what is y'all's procedure? And I called the hospital that they were going to end up sending me to if I had the baby too soon. So what they did was they told the birth center, they asked me who I was delivering with. And I oh, them. no. And so they they told the birth center and the birth center called me the next mo- next uh two days later and like we're gonna have to drop you. <gasps> yeah. Which They're is like, completely gonna have- illegal. <laughs> we're gonna have to drop you. I- they was like, So what do you wanna do? I said, I wanna I explained myself. I was like, I want to have birth. I want to give birth to the birth center like I planned to. I called them because I thought I may be in labor, Mm -hmm. and I wasn't sure what to do. You guys said you wouldn't deliver them, deliver the baby before 37 weeks, and I wasn't 37 weeks, and she was Mm -hmm. like, it was the owner, too. It was the owner that called me. I was like, I just want to deliver, like, I hit 37 weeks. Like, I would like to deliver the way I planned with you all in the water birthing area. And she was like, oh, no, we're just going to have to drop you. And I was wow. Like, okay, it's, cool. it's cool. And I, you know what? I hate to, like, I hate to bring this up, but, like, I really did feel like she felt some type of way with me for one way or another. And sometimes, like, I didn't say anything about it, but I also talked to somebody else of color who had went there, and they got a similar treatment by the Really? I just felt like... I felt like, I don't know, I, she may be prejudiced or something. I don't mm-hmm. know, but. Well, look, yeah, I mean, so. we know that a lot of people are, and we know, of course, that women of color face this in the medical system, I mean, and other places, obviously, too, but specifically in the medical model, you know, in, in so many different ways. So, you know, your your instincts I are mean, probably right, unfortunately. I, yeah, I mean, I I paid attention to the way that she interacted with every other mother, and her her interactions with me were just not on the same level. And I just I felt that, and I was just like, you know what, it's cool. That sucks. It's fine. It's fine. It wasn't meant to be, because you know what, she did me a favor. Yeah, that's the thing. She did I, me a I, I talked to a couple of women of color who have un, who have birthed unassisted, and you know, some of them have straight out said. I understand the health disparities of birthing in the hospital as a black woman, and I am not willing to put myself and my baby in that level of danger in the hospital. And so I'm actually choosing to birth at home, which is, you know, super powerful. It just seems like like some people just, 
like they see you and they just don't care about your well-being. Like that doctor who just completely cut me open and sucked in my baby out. Like we just didn't matter. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, yeah, I could I could go on all day about that. But anyway, so back to the story. Um, thirty-six weeks. I hit thirty-seven weeks, and she's like, "We're gonna drop you." And I'm like, "All right." So I try to find a midwife. Nobody's available. So I find a doula one doula and she's an hour away. Um, we talk from that point on until I have my son for at thirty nine weeks. So around thirty seven weeks. So I had a doula for like two weeks. And I <laughs> Wait, never so she met didn't her. she didn't come to the birth. Uh uh-uh. uh. I okay. never met her. And we we pretty much planned for it and just in case she didn't make it to me for me to do it unassisted. Mm-hmm. So So, basically, she was just like a Facebook messenger support system at that point because I never (laughs) met her. I still haven't met her. I still haven't met her. Um, And never talked to her. or Well, I talked to her a couple times over the phone. And um, she was like a doula. Like, that was only not – well, her fee was only $900. Like, that's expensive, but it's still – like, I was able to swing that if I needed to do it. Sure. And – I was willing to do it versus going to the hospital and dealing with whatever trauma may ensue from that. So, and what did you what did you potentially get from the doula, knowing that she's non medical, so she wasn't going to be able to do anything like in an emergency or something? But but what were you get, getting out of her supporting you? She was supporting me while well, anything like when I t- would have like issues like uh, for a while I had a yeast infection that would not go away oh let me backtrack the way the way I passed my GDS um group strep B test because mm-hmm. I was because I had yeast a lot and I didn't know if that would make me pop positive like I was just really nervous about it because of the antibiotic situation sure. so for like 10 days straight I put a whole garlic clove up in my vagina. Mm-hmm. I poked holes in it with a fork and stuck it in there, and I came out negative because uh, garlic kills it. It's a natural antibiotic. Well, it all it, it's very temporary because the GBS is actually in the gut. It's happening in right. the gut, and then it comes down into you know the vaginal and rectal area. So the the yeast, the garlic, it it can work to get a negative, but it's very temporary. If you're producing that true bacteria out of your gut, it's not going to fix the gut. Um, But, you know, in the hospital system, it is a good trick to temporarily get a negative, totally. And I was completely okay with that. (laughs) Totally, yeah. You didn't care either way. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because, like we said, like, it's it's very rarely transferred anyway. So Mm -hmm. I was completely okay with that. And at but, the end of the day, um, yeah. it's up to you. You know, you're the mom. You're the guardian of your baby. And I just, I, I get so fed up with this idea that the medical model cares more about your baby than you do. Like, that is, yeah. that is not, that is not true. You know, it is, it is a very, very, very rare and, and sick woman who doesn't care, you know, about the wellness of her baby. I've never met a woman like that. You know, it's, right. It's it's so degrading to the mother to act like not only do they know best, but they care more. Yeah, because you're you're gonna see this baby and raise it and take care of it. Exactly. From the stuff this time. And like you pointed to, I mean, you're just a number at a hospital or this high volume birth center. Your baby's just a number. Like, of course, they want you guys to survive, but beyond that, they don't care. You know, you're not yeah, like a part of their. Probably- Right, whereas as long for you, as you don't negatively affect them and you don't sue them, they don't. They're good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're completely fine. Um, so you're thirty. You go into labor at thirty nine weeks. Yeah, so I go into labor while um, I'm washing dishes. And is, watching is the your TV show. is your man at this point like totally on board, and or is he still kind of anxious? I mean, so this is what we did. This is what I did. The whole time, like, my doula was like, yeah, you know what you need to do? Find out everything that you can, that can possibly go wrong and figure out what you're going to do about it. So in this instance, what are you going to do? At what point do you think you need to call 911? Because 
you need to be aware that that might be a possibility. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I found out what I need to do if the cord is wrapped around his neck, if I hemorrhage, um, which is eat a piece of your placenta, um, mm-hmm. and all these other things that could possibly go wrong with birth. And I prepare for them. I watch every YouTube video of birth. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I watch a bunch of documentaries on birth. Pretty much for those from from 37 weeks until I gave birth, I was all about birth. Mm -hmm. Everything I could possibly consume and get my hands on, I was reading about it, and I was relaying all the information to my husband, my sister, and my mother. And my mother had come up like a week prior to the fact that I gave birth. And we, when she was there, we was watching all kinds of TV shows and stuff about birth. Um, I ordered a couple things like a cord cutter, some little, the little things that catch, uh, the little pads that you sit on. Mm -hmm. Um, What else? I I had a fetoscope and I ordered, I had a stethoscope. And pretty much that's all I really needed. Mm -hmm. I think I ordered a couple of other things, but that's all I ended up really using. So I go into labor while, um, I'm washing dishes, and, like, I'm just, like, my mom is, like, are you all right? And I was, like, I think I might be a waiver. I'm having some really strong contractions. She was, like, well, sit down. I'm going to finish the dishes. I was, like, nope. I'm just going to keep rocking back and forth and wash dishes in between each wave. (laughs) That's what I did. That's what I did until I finished the dishes, and then I felt this, like, strong urge to poop, and so I was, like, okay. Oh, my gosh. Um. I was like, hey, guys, um, I might be giving, like, he might be coming out right now. So I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I need to poop. So I went and I pooped. And, like, I don't remember if I pooped or not. I tried. I think maybe, like, a little <laughs> came out. Yeah. I tried. Like, okay, so meanwhile, my sister is heating up hot water because we didn't have a lot of hot so hot water supply in my old house. My sister heats up hot water. My husband cleans out the tub and starts running the water and lights my candles. And everybody's trying to contact my doula. Oh, no. (laughs) What happened? (laughs) Everybody's trying to contact my doula. This happened at, when did I go in labor? I went in labor at around 1130 because I was only in labor for 90 minutes. Um, around 1130, because I had my son right before one. So, yeah, I get in, I poop, and I get in the tub, and... Um, but wait, where where was your doula? Did she just not make it, or was she not able to no, get a hold of it? She didn't answer the phone until I started scrambling. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> like I said, I was only in labor for 90 minutes. Yeah. So, uh, I get in the tub, and I'm, like, screaming. <laughs> screaming and instead of instead of doing what I was supposed to do like the things I paid attention to when I was looking at birth and everything I didn't pay attention to the way you're supposed to breathe I was looking mm-hmm. at an emergency situation so I'm like screaming and screaming and I'm like <laughs> and I'm like nobody's got no hold of the new one and I, I got mad I was like if this B, don't answer the phone. I got mad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why is she not answering the phone? Yeah, totally. So, um. Uh, That's fair. That's kind of the whole point of the doula. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm screaming, and she finally gets on the phone, and she was like, tell her to stop screaming. She needs to, like, <laughs> do a low moan. Do a low moan, a guttural moan, and it'll feel better. And when I did that, it did feel better, mm-hmm. a lot better. It definitely worked way better. Um, but, yeah, so I um, that I started doing that, and he was coming out. And I'm trying to think. It happened so fast. Yeah, it sounds like it. You were basically did the dishes. And then pooped and then went in the bathtub and had your baby. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much how fast it went. So I got yeah. in there and he, like, at one point, I just was getting tired of waiting on him. I stood up and started bouncing. I was just like basically twerking, trying to get him to come out. And I was just like, <laughs> what are you doing? 
what are you doing? He was like, you're going to make them fall out. I was like, no, you're going to the point. Please just get this baby out of me. <laughs> so uh, he was like, yeah, sit down, sit down. So I got back down on my knees. And, and like, hindsight, next time I'm going to do like a yoga mat or something in the tub because my knees was hurting doing that. Um, but I ended up giving birth, like, on all fours, and my husband caught him. Mm-hmm. He started he started crying. Like, as soon as his chest came out a little bit, he started crying. He didn't even say he wasn't even fully out before he started crying. Um, the baby the baby, or your husband? <laughs> my baby. My baby. I have a video on Instagram. I could, I could send you the birth video. Yeah, we um, can post it. Definitely. I'll send it to you. But he started crying before he was even fully out. Mm-hmm. And I remember feeling down there, and I was like, is he out yet? And I felt something. I was like, what is that? It just felt really weird. And it turned out to be his head and, like, all of the stuff that was in his hair. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was confused for a second. But um, he finally came out. My husband caught him. Um, and then I turned over, and he handed him to me. And it was just. It was amazing. It was completely empowering. Nobody mm. was telling me what to do. It was completely on my terms. It was absolutely perfect. Mm. Absolutely perfect. The only thing that went the way I didn't want it to go, and this is completely back to my first birth, I tore exactly where that man cut me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly where he cut me. And uh, the thing about when you... Uh, when they're crowning it, you got to breathe through, not push, and let them slide on out. And he slid on out, but I still tore. I still tore away. So, it. and it what makes did... me wonder how that. Sorry, go ahead. it makes me it it makes me wonder if I would have tore it off. He hadn't cut me right there. Sure, I, of course. I, well, so what I did you do... what did you do with that tear? Did you have to go in and get it sutured, or did you just let it ride? I uh, no. I didn't go in and get stitches. I left it yeah. alone. Mm-hmm. And it healed on its own. <laughs> yeah. It took a long time because I actually messed up, messed it up from healing. I thought I was starting my period at one point, and it was um, – I had stopped bleeding after, after – I don't remember the time frame, but I thought I had stopped bleeding, and, it, and then I started bleeding again, so I thought it was my period. So I put a diva cup in there, and I just mm-hmm. messed it up. Yeah. So it's – it took longer to heal, and it was pretty painful for several months. Um, mm, I bet. But that was my fault. That was my fault. So, um, And how was breastfeeding yeah, I, the second time around? Breastfeeding was so easy. It was like it never stopped. I breastfed my first until he was two. Mm-hmm. So it's like it wasn't like a big deal. Like, so I went basically one year without breastfeeding, and I was back to breastfeeding. Back in the saddle. Cause, yes, because he was three at the time. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, I gave birth to him, and we sat in the tub, and it, I I delivered my placenta. And, like, at this point, I should have just hung up with the doula because she was rushing me. She was like, oh, the placenta should be out by now. And it really, it takes as long as it takes for the yeah. placenta to come out. As long and, as you're not hemorrhaging, it's true. And I wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. She was like, the placenta should be out by now. And so rushing, trying to get it out, not not paying attention to my body at that point, I was, like, pushing and pushing it. So when it came out, it broke open. Mm. And that made me mad because I planned on longest birth in him. And I was ready. I had everything. I had a longest birth bag. I had all the herbs. I had a big thing of salt. I was ready for it. Um. But I couldn't do that because the bus opened. So instead, I just waited. I I didn't get out of the tub for two hours. I but your bleeding was bleeding. okay. Yeah, my bleeding was fine. It was completely. I was completely fine. Um, I didn't get out of the tub for two hours, and uh, I was waiting for his cord to completely stop pulsating. It was completely white by the time I got out. Mm-hmm. And we find and we finally cut it at that point. But that was also why I wanted to load this birth so he could get absolutely everything from the placenta. But it, it broke up, and then I couldn't risk the infection it might cause. Totally, yeah. Um, so, so what was 
So then did you ever follow up with the birth center after that? No. Or I guess they had already Uh, dropped you, so I guess it didn't matter. Yes, they dropped me. What did I go there for? I had to go there to to get a birth certificate. I had to Mm -hmm. go there to get proof that they had seen me, to see, like, proof, like, paperwork saying that they had seen me pregnant and they had seen my baby afterwards. Like, not, like, physically, like, done a physician checkup, but just, Mm -hmm. like, seeing the baby, that the baby was alive. Mm-hmm. So that was it. That's the only reason I went back. Um, but nah, we didn't. We didn't go back to them. Won't go and, back to them either. Yeah. And how did your community respond? You know, as as you shared your story. Oh, I, I had a lot of people who were like, "Oh my god, I can't believe you did that." I had a couple of people repost my stuff and like, "Look at her, congratulations! <laughs> I'm so proud of you." Da da da. Like, mm-hmm. I can't believe you did that. Like, and, and anytime I tell somebody that doesn't know about it already, they're just like in in utter shock. Mm-hmm. And like hindsight had somebody told me this before I had kids, I would be too because it's not normal. Like I don't mm-hmm. hear about this all the time. I actually rarely hear about it unless I'm looking for the information. Totally. I had yeah. to search for an assisted group on Facebook, and they provided a lot of support and, like, a lot of information. I learned a lot from them as well. Mm-hmm. I'm still a part of them just in case I have another because I totally plan on doing this again. Completely. So how how did you navigate the – Kind of like the the what if factor in preparing, you know, knowing that you guys would be alone, knowing that even if your doula had made it, she's non medical. So how did you navigate the potential concerns, you know, of what if something happens? Like I said, I prepared. Like if something happened that we were, we knew we were gonna have to call nine one one. That was always in the back of my mind. But at the same time, I was like, I'm not gonna feed into the negative energy. I prepared myself as much as I can mm-hmm. for any possible possible negative outcome. But I'm not giving energy. I just kept envisioning the way I wanted the birth to go, and it went that way. Other than the tail, which it was out of my hands in the first. Yeah, time. and so, it came so fast. Yeah. But I just kept focusing on the way I wanted to go and preparing myself for the way I wanted to, it to go. And I um, drank uh, a lot of red raspberry leaf tea and metal leaf tea. And I had, um, I when I when I started to go into labor, when I realized I was going into labor right before I went in, to go put things in the tub, I took mugwort, black cohosh, blue cohosh, and alfalfa and I probably took nettle as well. I took all of those extracts. And You're I like, I'm just gonna them. load up just in case. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. like, hey, if it, I knew all of those assisted in one way or another towards labor and at the time I knew exactly what all of them did. So I took all of them. I was like, hey, if this is what it is, this is I'm gonna go ahead and there's no harm now. Mm-hmm. Because one of them uh Blue cohosh or black cohosh, I can't remember, or maybe both. Both of them, they, they assist in uterine contraction. Mm-hmm. So I was like, you know what? Hey, I'm 39 weeks. If he wants to come, if I take this, and he's, I'm not a labor now, hey. <laughs> so it, it, so you, you felt relatively fearless and just, like, confident going into it? Well, yeah, because I was empowered with information. I knew what I was doing. This wasn't my first time. I did... I did, like, when I say I did a ton of research, <laughs> I barely slept anyway because I was thinking <laughs> he would let me sleep. So I was always looking at births and reading all of these, not only that, looking at all these unassisted births in mm-hmm. the group that I was in. Like, and they helped me a lot. Mm-hmm. It's it, it just so, like the community, like, you're just surrounded by people who are, like-minded you'll feel more empowered you'll feel more knowledgeable about all of it well exactly and that's that's exactly why I wanted to do this podcast because there are people you know around the world who are making these choices and how cool to be able to listen to your story and all the other amazing women that have shared their stories and it's it all of a sudden becomes not that radical of an idea and it does become more normal exactly 
And I've seen, I've seen this one lady on YouTube. She was outside. Won't nobody around her. She squatted, popped her baby out, and walked away. And that was <laughs> That's so awesome. I want to do that so bad. <laughs> I had another lady in the group that I'm in. She was in her bathroom. She popped her baby out. He had um, his cord wrapped around his throat. And you know they, they. I mean, it's, it can be dangerous, but at the same time, it also can be normal. And it was normal in that that case because she just unwrapped it and kept it moving. The baby was fine, mm-hmm. absolutely fine. The baby is great. The baby's like three years old now. He's mm-hmm. great. So. Yeah, definitely felt empowered in 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 my the, how knowledgeable I was on the subject and the communities that I had put myself in and yeah. surrounded myself in. Yeah, and it's interesting because a lot of women who have a hospital birth with their first, who have a vaginal birth, but when they like you, when you look back on your story, the only things that went wrong in your birth was shit that was done to you or your baby, right. you know, nothing about, yeah, nothing about your ability, you know, to give birth was a problem. You did not leave with a story like a lot of women do. Oh, that doctor saved my baby, or I'm so glad I was in the hospital. Um, you know, you left with a story and I'm putting words in your mouth, correct me if I'm wrong, but I did just fine. And they really did a bunch of unnecessary stuff to me. Exactly. And so it gave, exactly. it, I think I've been seeing that, yeah, with, with other free birthing moms where it, it gives you an interesting level of confidence to say, well, when I look at my previous birth, everything as far as my baby and I were concerned went swimmingly, but where other people were involved, they kind of screwed up those pieces. And so I'm just going to go do it on my own because I already trust my ability to give birth. And that's another thing. Like I read a couple books. I more like skimmed them. I looked for what I needed, and I, I kept it moving and found another book. But, like, first of all, it's people in other countries who have babies without all of this intervention with no problem, with no problem, and it's normal, and that's the thing. And I'm just like, not only that, but this is what my body was meant to do, and I'm not unhealthy, and I'm actually – this second time coming around, I was way more healthy than mm-hmm. I was in the first one. So I'm like, I trust my body. I know what my body knows what it's meant to do, and I need to trust it and let it do what it's going to do. And and your baby. You know, that's a whole other piece that is so beautiful of, of trusting your baby, that they're meant to do this and that they want to come out in a way that nature intended. You know, and one of my favorite yeah. quotes ever is, um, birth is meant to work alone in the woods. You know, I, I love that. Yeah. And I think it just gives me so much confidence. And, and again, I mean, the, the emergencies and the problems that I have seen in birth, you know, of attending hundreds of births are, were almost always based in the intervention. The thing is, I, I, the way I feel about Western medicine is this in an, in an event of an emergency, Okay, cool. But other than that, let things, like, you need to take care of your body naturally. Feed it the right foods and take care of it the way it needs to be taken care of instead of all these medicines and all these interventions. It's just, it, it pretty much put a Band-Aid on the issue in the first place because these medicines don't fix anything. They yeah. just cover up the symptoms. Mm-hmm. So uh, another thing, like, when I had him, Something that I didn't know until I found like three days later. Um, once you have them, um, you know your area is like swollen and mm-hmm. torn. And it, it's absolutely terrible to pee. It hurts. Mm, it's yeah. Like, terrifying. What I ended up doing, like my my uh, mother in law, she's a nurse, and she was like, "Oh, you need to get that freezing thing." And I'm like, "That sounds like a bunch of bullshit and chemicals. Mm-hmm. I don't want to have a item. So I was like, she said it freezes, and I'm like, what essential oil do I have that does that? Peppermint. So I put some peppermint in a bottle and some water, and I sprayed my vagina before I went to pee every time, and it was absolutely amazing. It really? Was <laughs> it was great. Nice. I was like, this feels so good. <laughs> nice. I've never heard I, of peppermint oil. 
Join us next week for another episode of the Free Birth Podcast. Thanks for joining us. And remember, your body, your choice. Lots of love.